Thumbs up from the sound desk, that's good. Have I got a thumbs up from the vision desk? Are we ready? Yes, I do. Excellent, it looks like we can go. Uh, well, not go, stay please, don't go anywhere. The Lord be with you. And also with you. It's so lovely to see you here on this sunny, sunshiny Sunday morning. Uh, welcome to our, our service, uh, our morning praise. Uh, and uh, we're starting today uh, the beginning of a series where we're looking across the next number of weeks into that scary book of revelation um and uh, dealing with all that kind of uh, symbolic imagery and things that come through uh, the book of revelation i'm really excited about it really excited about starting that today um and it's an important thing for us as we as we continue to emerge as a church and as a nation from lockdown and and, and pandemic and all that kind of thing there's a lot going on with all of that still but the book of Revelation gives us an important place to look in relation to all of that. So all of that to come. Look forward to sharing in that with you. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on notices this morning. Um, I'm just going to say uh, we're going to enter into a time of sung worship now. After the first song, youngsters, uh, whilst we pause between that song and the next song, that's the time for you to exit. In case I forget to say it in the middle of... Uh, <laughs> of our worship youngsters at, at the end of our first song that's when you go okay maybe the leaders could go with them as well and help sort out their session that would be good too um but uh, as we come to worship the lord the opening chapter of revelation which we'll hear read later has some incredible words for us to help us focus on on, on who we are on who he is and what we're doing here we've come to worship the risen lord who's made promises to us and there's this prayer that John, who received the vision, starts with. He says, grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood, and has made us to be a kingdom and priests to serve his God and Father. To him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Let's stand, let's worship the Lord in song.
will leave us now to head off to their groups and we pray for them as they go loving heavenly father may they know your presence with them and may they be drawn closer to you in knowledge and love uh, through all that they do this morning we commit them to you in the name of jesus amen
that Lord who's broken every chain and restored us to relationship with him, asks us to keep short accounts with him, to confess our sins. At this moment, if you've been standing too long, feel free to sit. Uh, it's up to you. Feel free. But just as the music plays, let's lay before the Lord our confession. Let's say sorry to him for the things that we've done. We say together, most merciful God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we confess that we have sinned in thought, word and deed. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbours as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been. Help us to amend what we are and direct what we shall be, that we may do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with you, our God. Amen. And echoing the promises of Scripture, Almighty God who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon us. Pardon and deliver us from all our sins. Confirm and strengthen us in all goodness. And keep us in life eternal. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. All of those things. That pardon, that deliverance, that strengthening, that eternal life is ours. Through our good, good Father.
Father, we thank you for who we are in you. We're restored. We're redeemed. We're loved. We're forgiven. We're children of you. We praise you and we thank you. In the name of the one who makes it all possible, Jesus, our Savior. Amen. 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 Please do take a seat. And Mags is going to come and read to us um, from Revelation chapter 1. Thanks, Mags. The reading is from Revelation chapter 1, page 1233 in the Church Bibles. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who testifies to everything he saw. That is, the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Blessed is the one who reads the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it, because the time is near. John, to the seven churches in the province of Asia, grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits before his throne and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood, and has made us to be a kingdom, and priests to serve his God and Father. To him be glory and power for ever and ever. Amen. Look, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him even those who pierced him. And all the peoples of the earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. Amen. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus, was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. On the Lord's day, I was in the spirit and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet, which said, write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia and Laodicea. I turned round to see the voice that was speaking to me. And when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And among the lampstands was someone like a son of man, dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet and with a golden sash round his chest. His head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp double-edged sword. His face was like the sun, shining in all its brilliance. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead, and behold, I am alive for ever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and Hades. Write, therefore, what you have seen, what is now, and what will take place later. The mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand, and of the seven golden lampstands, is this. 
The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, to God. God. Thank you, Manx. I'm quite excited for next week now. This, this week's page was 1233. Three, three. That means next week's page is 1234. Just a little observation there to get you excited. Let's pray as we come to consider God's word. Father, we thank you for this book at the end of the Bible, this uh, revelation from you to John. And Lord, we pray that as we come to face it and see all the strangeness within it, Lord, that we may see clearly you and all that you have to say to us through it. Lord, may your spirit be at work in us, opening our eyes, our ears, our hearts to the truth of your word. And Lord, be at work in me this morning. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'm not sure how you feel as we come to the start of the book of Revelation. Uh, oh no, Jim's decided to do a series on Revelation. Gulp. Maybe you're wary, afraid even, about facing the, the weird and wonderful images and pictures that will appear before us as we wade through this, uh, this very, very important book of Scripture that is so frequently avoided by so many. And I put my own hand up to that. I've been here four years in a bit now, and um, I haven't preached on it yet. <laughs> uh, and I thought it's about time. I, you know, I've preached on bits of Revelation, but I've never taken it from beginning to end before. And that's what we're going to be doing over these next few weeks. Um, so, so many Christians are wary of this book, but there's no need to be wary of this book. I've entitled this series, A Word for Our Day. Because although this was written by John on Patmos all those years ago, thousands of years ago, this frequently avoided scripture is so important and pertinent for the church today. It has for our particular moment, maybe every church across all the ages has been able to say that, that this is so relevant to our situation today. But it's true. This is so pertinent to our church today. I'll unpack that a little further as we go. John received this revelation from Jesus via an angel, as we're told in those uh, opening words, to make known truths to the servants of Jesus. It says that in there. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what soon must take place. This is a revelation given that the servants of Jesus can know stuff. Stuff that's going on now, stuff that's going to go on in the future. And the word that's translated revelation in verse 1 of chapter 1 um, is the word apocalypsis, which can mean revel revelation. It's to reveal something. It's to make clear that which was hitherto unknown. It's to lay something bare. And so in a sense, John as he describes this revelation that's been given to him to us, is just putting before us the naked truth of what God wants us to know about what's gone on and what's to come. About what's gone on in the past, about what's going on now and what is to come, which is no accident because we're dealing with the God who is, who was, and who is to come. Reference time and again through Revelation. The revelation that was given to John was given for his church going through a tough time. The church was suffering under a power-mad, emperor-worshipping, anti-Christian, deluded regime. And already you're beginning to see how it's relevant to our day. <laughs> Slap, don't be political. John himself is writing this from Patmos likely a penal colony, and he's been put there as a punishment for his missionary work, promoting the gospel of Jesus in the face of what the emperor of the time wanted, which was emperor worship. And everything that John was doing and saying was against that, so he was imprisoned for it on Patmos. John, 
was sharing in the current suffering of the church. He tells us that in verse 9. I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus. He was part of this suffering. He was part of the struggle because of the work he was doing for the sake of the gospel. And in the midst of that, Jesus presents John and his church, if you like, with a vision that will lift their eyes beyond the now to encourage the faithful to persevere in the face of it all. And how were they to persevere in the face of it all? Well, they were to look at what John was revealing, describing to him, uh, Jesus was revealing it, but John was describing what has been revealed. And by looking and seeing that Jesus is Lord, Jesus is the lamb who was slain. Jesus is the one who is ultimately victorious and allows us to share in that victory by seeing that the wicked will perish and that those in Christ are sealed against any spiritual harm and will be vindicated when Christ returns. And God's people will, in him, enter into an eternity of glory and blessedness all of that will be revealed as we journey through Revelation together over the coming weeks. But that's what John is describing in this, as he explains as best he can, this revelation that he's received from Jesus. He's holding it up and saying, look here, because this will get you through. This will make sense of what's going on. This will help you to stand when everything else around you is trying to pull you away from standing. It's a vision to encourage those trapped in despair. And it's as relevant for us as it was for John and those he wrote this down for back then. This is a letter. See how it unfolds in the same way as the pastoral letters uh, earlier in the New Testament from verse 4, where he says, John, identifying who he is, to the seven churches in the province of Asia, identifying who he was writing to. It's a letter that's being written here. But in that letter, there are so many pictures. It's a letter with pictures. Pictures of what the Lord wanted his people to know. It's pictures presented in a prophecy. In, in chapter 1, uh, verses 1 to 3, we're describing it, the vision, this apocalypsis that, that Jesus is revealing to John. Uh, blessed is the one who reads the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it. He wants, he wants more than hearing. He wants the thing taken to heart. He wants this thing experienced so that the people of God can be encouraged. He wants this letter with pictures to get to their hearts and affect them and form them and encourage them. And it was written to his servants across the churches. And, you know, one of the first things to say with the weird symbolism of Revelation is the number seven the number seven will appear time and again. The seven churches, the seven spirits have been mentioned uh, here. And um, yes, there were seven churches in Asia, and they're all identified as we, we knock on into, into chapter two and read about the letters to those churches. But the number seven is significant, and we need to remember the significance of seven. It's, it's a, a frequently used, especially here, uh, biblical reference for completeness and perfection. The number seven represents perfectness. Just made a word up. Perfection is what's represented in there. So the letters to the seven churches, it means the letters to the complete church. He wants everybody to get this. And that's why he's encouraging John to write it down. And he wants those who hear it read to experience it in their hearts. So that includes us today. As we hear this letter with pictures read over the next few weeks, as we encounter the different images and, and symbols and the apocalyptic nature of this story that's being told about what's going on now and what's going to go on in the future, we've got to not be afraid of those things. We've got to do our work and wrestle with these things and come to understand them and allow them just to take root in our hearts and enable us then to walk in the way that the Lord wants us to walk, with confidence in him and our future, even if what's going on around us would whip the rug of that from under us 
and our confidence would go. I can't tell you how helpful it has been to me to be working on this this week. After being knocked back again in relation to COVID in the pandemic, and we seem to be making progress and heading towards normality, and then bam, we're back to wearing masks through a service. We're back to having to have restrictions in place and windows open. And my confidence was knocked. I was beginning to think, oh, Jim, are you going to be the one who presides over a, a church that collapses in on itself? And then I came to this, and I'm like, no, I'm not, because I'm not in control. Boris isn't in control. Well, we've known that for a while. <laughs> the Lord is in control. The Lord is in control, and he's the one who holds all this in his hands, and it's him that we need to look to, and that's what John is doing here. We need to take this to heart. Because what we experience now, revelation will make a difference to how we face it. Our now has significant troubles. Over the last two years, there have been plenty of them. COVID-19, the closure of our churches, the closure in inverted commas, because we claimed to be open because we kept things going online. But the closure of our churches was a hard thing. The church's own struggle to handle that closure was a hard thing. Steep learning curves about what to do in the face of that closure was a hard thing. And then, as we begin to come out of it, we discover that some Christians are then using the pandemic to say, well, I'm going to stop seeing church as a priority. I quite liked not going to church. I quite liked the space it gave me on a Sunday, etc., etc. There's all kinds of things being said in conversations with people. And that shifting of a priority is a challenge it's a challenge for them because they might well be letting go of something that's eternally important for them but it's a challenge for the church too and how we respond to that and how we look to rebuild and, and address all of that as we look to the future those challenges those troubles are real but covid is not the only oppressor of the church current culture wars where groups arguing for tolerance have become more intolerant of those that think differently to them. And that's, that's in relation to all kinds of things, whether it's gender, sex, human relationships, morality, media content, politics, materialism. We live in a society that looks and sounds friendly, but isn't. There isn't open persecution of the church in the UK yet. But it is real. It's growing. And society is being seduced along a very unhelpful and dangerous road. Dangerous for them, not just the church, as they let go of all kinds of things and head into all kinds of things. And in the face of that, in the face of those troubles and struggles that are ours, we come to this, which was given to John on Patmos. The vision that John shares paints an incredible, incredible vision of the majesty of Jesus. I've put this picture up. It, there are all kinds of ones out there on the internet, and there's some weird and wonderful, wonderful representations of this, this particular thing that, that John paints the picture of with his words um, in chapter 1. And that was the best I could find because you've got it all there. You've got the seven golden lampstands. You've got the seven stars in the Lord's hands. You've got the sword coming out of his mouth. You've got the radiance, the long robe, the sash. You've got John at his feet. It's all there. The picture is there. And by writing that and holding that out to the church, John is saying, meet Jesus. Not the one that you've just remembered in a manger. Not the one around Galilee performing miracles and, and wonders. Not even the one on the cross. Not even the one that walked out of the empty tomb. But look at this Jesus. This is Jesus as he is now. This is the crucified, risen, ascended Lord who has gone to that place of prominence at the right hand of his Father, where he rules in sovereign power over all that is. This is the glorified Lord, the Lord who is the object of our worship. Meet 
him in these words. See him in these words and realize who it is that you're worshiping. Realize who is in charge and hold on to that and allow him to help you stand in whatever is coming your way. So who is he? John makes it clear as he begins to describe what he's seen on the Lord's day when he was in the spirit, caught up in the spirit on the Lord's day, on a Sunday, worshipping the Lord. He was caught up and he saw this. He met Jesus. First he heard his voice that was like a loud trumpet. And then he turned and saw him standing amongst the lampstands, the lampstands that represent the church, the seven churches that he's about to go into detail on chapter two. Meet Jesus. This Jesus is eternal. He was and is and is to come. He has no beginning and no end. He's eternal. This is the real Jesus that you worship. This is the real Jesus who's in charge. He's the beginning and the end, we're told in verse 8. This Jesus is risen from the dead and alive now, we're told in verse 5. He's the firstborn from the dead. This Jesus rules from heaven, again in verse 5 the firstborn of the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth. He's in charge of everything. This Jesus set us free by his blood. This Jesus has made us into a kingdom and priests to serve God our Father, verse 6. This Jesus who has done that is coming back, verse 7. But he's coming back differently to how he came before. He will be unmistakable and all will see him, we're told. How unmistakable will you be? Well, look at and grasp the reality of scene one of John's vision. Look at what he lays before the people of God and see the Lord. See the Lord standing in the midst of the churches, the seven golden lampstands. Let all churches be centered on this Jesus. Let all churches look to him. One like a son of man, we're told echoing Daniel's vision back in the Old Testament. And that's the thing about this revelation, this laying bare before us the truth. Uh, when this was written, it was written to people who would have got these references instantly. They would have known the scriptural background to these descriptions that are being put forward. So they would have known about Daniel's vision that includes one like a son of man and includes the ancient of days described in all his glory. Notice the robe and the golden sash. Again, that comes from Exodus chapter 28 and Leviticus chapter 8, a picture of Jesus as our great high priest, the one who stands between us and God and mediates on our behalf. This is the Jesus who we see in Revelation. The head and hair as white as snow. And here perhaps we get closer to the, the pictures of God that people might draw as an old man with white hair. But here that symbolizes wisdom and dignity of a ruler. He's got eyes like blazing fire. Eyes that are penetrating and see to the heart and see to the truth of whoever and whatever they encounter. Feet like bronze glowing in a furnace, a reference to God's glory, like you'll find in Ezekiel chapter 1. His voice is like the roar of rushing waters, loud, and again recalls the voice of the multitude in Daniel 10, or God's own voice in Ezekiel 1 and Ezekiel chapter 43. He held the seven stars in his hand, the seven angels who were over the seven churches in Asia. This God is so powerful. Out of his mouth comes a double-edged sword, a phrase we've encountered before if we've read Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12, which talks about a double-edged sword coming out that, that, is, that is about judgment and cutting, cutting to the heart, cutting through bone and marrow to the truth. This sword is a sword of judgment and authority that again echoes the Old Testament, Isaiah chapter 11. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. This is a God who is loving, who is rescuing, but he's also the judge. And let's not lose sight of that important truth. It puts everything else in its context. Judgment will come to all. Whatever it looks like they're getting away with now. Judgment coming for each and every one of us. 
and then his face as bright as the sun in all its radiance. Another reference to the unmistakable glory of the Lord and perhaps a reminder for New Testament readers of the, uh, the shining appearance of Jesus as he's transfigured uh, in those stories we're told in the Gospels. The glorified Jesus, the real identity of Jesus on display here not giving as a word for word description of what he actually looks like, but giving as an insight into what he is like, this Lord of all. He's terrible, he's a judge. He's awe-inspiring, he's filled with glory. He knows our hearts with those eyes of blazing fire. This is an incredible picture of Jesus. And John, like Isaiah, when he has his vision of God in Isaiah chapter 6, he, he falls to the ground as though dead, completely overwhelmed by what's going on around him. And Jesus, what does he do? He reaches out to John, puts his hand on his shoulder, he touches him, and he tells him to not be afraid. Do not be afraid, verse 17. He has no need to fear. No need to fear what he's encountering in that moment on the Lord's day, whilst in the spirit. And he's got no need to fear all that he or the church might su be suffering or struggling through at that moment in time. Why? Because of who Jesus is and who they are in him. Verses 17 to 18. Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead and behold, I am alive forever. And I hold the keys of death and Hades. That's who Jesus is. He's the one who holds all the power over life and death. He's the one who is ruler supreme over all. Even the things that we fear the most. Even our own death. He is Lord over that. And John's saying, look to him. Meet him. Know him. Each of Jesus' self-descriptions there are designed to overcome John's fear of what's going on. He's the eternal one, the first and the last. He's the risen one, was dead but now alive. Death has been defeated, our last enemy. He is Lord over that. He holds the keys to death and Hades. John need not be afraid. The church need not be afraid. Whatever the Romans were doing to them, however long they'd be in prison, even if they were thrown to the lions in the amphitheatre for the entertainment of the crowds, they had no need to fear because of who Jesus is and because of who they are in him. And we, we need not be afraid. You and me because of who we are in him. If Jesus is our Lord, we can stand secure in the face of whatever the world throws at us, whatever it is. We too are blessed and need not be afraid if we take these words to heart, as we're instructed to do by John. We've got to hear the promise of this vision and the whole of Revelation actually, that no matter what Christ's church faces, no matter what Jim faces, insert your name into that space, no matter what we face, Jesus is Lord. And the future belongs to him. Nobody else, to him. We've got to see that. We've got to believe that. We've got to live in the light of that truth. That we need not fear. Verses 19 and 20 of that chapter go on to point us to the lampstands and the stars and the churches. But I'm going to leave that because that's for next week. For now, see what John saw. Lift your eyes to Jesus and let him inspire you to live in his context. The context of his history, his reality, his truth, not ours, his let this letter with pictures paint the truth of the reality that's in front of us now and the reality that is to come. Let's stand 
and let's worship the Lord, who is our King. Thank you, band. And as they get ready, let's just pray. Lord, open our eyes to the reality of who you are. May we drink in these words. May these words take root in our hearts. And Lord, may they shape us and form us and turn us into the Christians you would have us be. Lord, help us to keep our eyes fixed on you, our King, our Lord. We ask it in your name. Amen. Let's stand and worship together. So let's pray together. Please take a seat. How great is our God. Just in the quiet, just be thinking. How would you answer that if someone said, how great is your God? How would you answer that? Think about the things. Give thanks for the things that make our God great. Just in the quietness of your heart.
Heavenly Father, you've heard all those declarations of thanks in people's hearts right now about the things that make you great. Lord, it's almost an injustice to try and describe you and what you've done and what you mean to us. But we do give you thanks for your greatness, for your splendor, for your love. Lord, for your self-giving, for your sacrifice, for the salvation that's in you. For the life in abundance that's ours because of you. For the life that is eternal. you open up for us. And Lord, we give you thanks for all those things. And we pray again that you would be at work in us by your spirit, convicting our hearts of the truth of these things, that they might give us the confidence to stand in the face of whatever the world brings us, whatever our circumstances. May we stand on our faith in you and your wonder and your awesome power and your glory and your majesty and your love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And we call upon you in your majesty and in your glory. Lord, to be at work in this, your world. We pray for a world still gripped by a pandemic and ask, Lord, for you to break in, in your sovereign power, to bring healing and restoration, to bring an end to this pandemic, that the world might be set free from its grip. Lord, we pray that you be at work in governments and the powers that be to cooperate, to ensure all the world All the world can be in receipt of vaccines and medicines. Not just the rich. Help the rich nations, Lord, be mindful of those who do not have what they have. Give those governments hearts of compassion and a desire to see that compassion through. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And Lord, we pray for your church. We pray for your church across the world in its witness at this time. Lord, may that church witness to the glory and the majesty and the power and the risen, ascended truth of who you are, that the world might come to know you as Lord. Give your church words with power that will speak to the hearts of those within and without those around them those in society those in our communities that we might be able to speak to them with words of power that will touch their hearts because your spirit is moving in that drawing them to you lord may your word take root in us and take root in our communities and in your world and may that word the work of your spirit transform hearts lives households communities and nations lord in your mercy hear our prayer and we call upon you in your sovereign power and in your sovereign will lord to be at work in the lives of those that we know who are struggling at this time through illness through disease through grief and pain and loneliness. And Lord, may you bring your healing, restore them to wholeness and touch their lives with your presence. Today we remember Rosemary. We remember Ernie. We remember Martin. We remember Jean, and in the quiet, name others before the Lord right now.
for all these names, Heavenly Father. We commit them to you. And we trust in your faithfulness and your will and your power to be at work in their lives. We pray this and all these things in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. And we continue in prayer, praying the prayer that Jesus himself taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. That Jesus that John describes to us is the Jesus in whom our hope is found. In the words of this last song, he is my light, my strength, my song, the cornerstone, the solid ground, the solid ground on which we stand. Let's worship him in song.
Father God, we thank you so much for Jesus. Jesus, our solid rock, the rock on which we can stand and not fear. Not fear because of him, because of all that he is and because of all that we are in him. And Lord, I pray that you'd equip us by your spirit to live that out this week. Wherever you've put us, wherever we move, whoever we're amongst, Lord, may that just shine out from us, that we stand on Jesus and we do not fear. And Lord, as we go from this place, may we go with your blessing, the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And may that blessing be upon us this day and always. Amen. Amen. Six o'clock tonight, service in here. Week two of our series in 1 Peter. Well worth coming along for. Look forward to seeing those of you who can make it here this evening. Um, COVID exits, please. That's all I'll say. God bless. Bye-bye. <laughs>